Amen. Good to see you in God's house today. Isn't God good? He's so good to us. Today is the most important message I've ever preached. We're living on the end of days, at the end of time. We've heard that our whole life. Those that have gone to church your life, you've heard it, that Jesus is coming. And I believe we're closer to the coming of the Lord than we've ever been. The signs of the times are everywhere. Uh, church, we need to get busy. We need to be about the Father's business. Today, I want us to look at Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 13. Would you stand for the reading of God's holy word? Hallelujah. I love the word of God. It's a road map. It's a guide. It's, it's our light. It's a lamp. It's the way we make it. So we need to look at God's word. I hope you're looking at it more than just on Sunday. And I hope you're reading behind the preacher to know that, that I'm preaching the truth. Amen. Too many false preachers out there because people aren't reading the book. And so therefore they're receiving a word that's not real. I challenge you, read the book. That way you'll know that what you're hearing on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, during revivals, and whether you're watching a preacher on the TV or listening to him on the radio, you'll know that you're receiving the truth. Amen. And let's look together today, Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 13. Jesus is doing the talking. Amen. I, I challenge you that if you're not a student of the Scripture, you, you're just been born again, you've just started attending church, and, and you don't know where to look at in God's Word. If you'll read the words in red, it's the very words that Jesus said. Of course, all of it is God's Word, but I challenge you, read the words in red, and when you read those, Jesus is speaking. And today we're looking at the words that Jesus spoke when He walked the earth. He's, he's talking to His disciples. He's talking to all those around Him. And here's what He says in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction or, or death. And there are many who go by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And they are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we, have we not prophesied in your name? Have, have we not cast out demons in your name? Have, have we not done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, Jesus is still talking. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Heavenly Father. Lord, I stand before you and your congregation, God, and I tremble at the thought that I will give an account for every word that proceeds out of my mouth. Father, I pray today, God, that you anoint my lips to preach like a man from another world. God, Lord, I understand and I acknowledge and I confess before you and your people that in my own strength I'm weak, in my own wisdom I'm ignorant. But it is your anointing, God, that makes preaching effective, God. Lord, you chose the foolishness of preaching. Lord, I pray today, God, Lord, that you would anoint our lips, Lord, anoint our ears and our hearts to receive your word. And Lord, if there be one here today, God, if one is listening, if one watches online, God, and they are lost, they, they do not know you, they, they're in a backslidden state, they, they've drifted away, God, I pray today, God, not that my word, but the word of the living God, Lord, would prick their heart, God, and they would consider eternity, God, for we'll all spend eternity somewhere. God, your desire is we spend it with you. Have your way this day in the blessed, holy, faithful, unchanging name, the name that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. You might be seated today in God's presence. Hallelujah. Today is the most urgent message. It's, it's the most important message I've, I've ever preached. You see, we're living in a day of all-inclusiveness. We are living in a world and we've raised a generation of people that, 
They believe that they're entitled to everything everybody else has. We've raised a generation and we teach in our school systems that everybody needs to be included in everything. We live in a world that says there can be no, no tolerance. We live in a world that says there will be no tolerance for intolerance. What, we, what do you mean, preacher? What, what are you saying? What, what does that have to do with the scripture we read? Well, we've created a society that, that believes this, that, that every kid deserves to go to the next grade even if they didn't pass the test. We've raised a generation of children that believe that even if they don't practice and they don't have the skills to play ball, they should be on the first string. We've raised a generation that says you can't call anybody a loser, but everybody's a winner. We have a government that says spread the wealth, that take the money of those that work and give it to those that are too lazy to work. It's spread the wealth. doesn't matter if they're too lazy or they don't want to work. Everybody deserves the same thing. We have raised a generation and we are now living in a day and age where everybody thinks they're owed something. It's the entitlement generation. And sadly, I'm afraid and I've witnessed and you've seen it that that, that mentality of, of everybody's involved, everybody deserves, it's crept into the church and today the church believes and teaches that everybody's going to heaven. Churches and ministries have changed their doctrine. They, they've cheapened heaven and they've weakened hell. And so they've changed the way they do kingdom business and they've accepted the idea that everybody, it's all inclusive, that everybody's going to heaven. And I'm afraid that there may be one or two here today that believe that. You believe you're going to heaven no matter how you live. Here we just read our text that it mentions false preachers, false prophets, preachers that say God understands, that God winks at sin, that, that God's a God alone, and that in the end we'll all be saved anyway. But that is simply not what the Bible teaches us. In our text, we read the words, and you heard the words, not everyone. Plainly speaking, not everybody's going to heaven. Not everybody's going to choose to strive to enter by the narrow gate. And we can learn much from these passages here in Matthew while Jesus is speaking to his congregation. He's preaching a message like we are preaching today. See, these verses tell us that everybody's not going to be saved. Not everybody's going to be born again. Not everybody's going to believe in the Lord. Not everybody's going to trust in Him as Lord and Savior. The tragedy of that is that you can be. You can be saved. God's will is that you're saved. God desires you to be saved. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever, that whosoever is anybody. It's red, yellow, black and white, short and tall, rich and poor, sick, well. It doesn't matter the language you speak or the shape of your eye or the texture of your hair. God said, whosoever believes in me should not perish. But the tragedy is there's people that believe they're going to heaven, but they do not believe in Jesus Christ. Many people simply reject Jesus. I don't know about you, but I've been rejected in my life. And I'm sure that you too have experienced great rejection, whether in elementary school or in junior high school, you start to fall in love and, and finally outside of the home you think somebody desires you and you get rejected or you get rejected for the job, you get rejected for the promotion. Rejection hurts and the fact of the matter is God's son will be rejected by most. In fact, many believe that there's more than one way to heaven and that everybody's going. A lot of people in the church feel that we are all God's children. I've heard it preached that we're all God's children, but my friend, that is not in the Scripture. You, you won't find that in the pages of the Bible. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that we are all God's creation. But only the saved, only those that have bowed their knee and yielded their heart, only those that have confessed their sin, only those that have acknowledged a need for a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, only those that have been born again are children of God. 
fact, John 1, 12 tells us this. But as many as received him, Jesus, to them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. See, what you believe changes how you live. What you believe determines the decisions you make. If you believe that you'll get bit by a dog, you'll be careful how you handle the dog. But if you believe a dog will never bite you, if you believe the snake won't get you, if you believe the car can go longer with the red light on warning you to get gas, see, what you believe determines how you live. And if you believe in Jesus, if you believe that He's the Son of God, if you believe that He said you must be holy for I am holy, if you believe He's coming again, it will change how you live. But not many people choose to believe in Jesus. If you want to be a child of God, if you want God to be your heavenly Father, then you must be born again. We also learn from Matthew chapter 7 from our text today that there will be many more people that die without Jesus than die with Him. See, the way and the path and the highway to hell, it's wide, it, it's broad, it's ever increasing. And the vast majority of the world is traveling down this wide, broad path road. What a tragedy to think that even our loved ones, those that we hold dear, are traveling down the wide way, the way that everybody's going. See, you have to understand today that the more a road is traveled, the wider it gets. It's like a trail in the woods. If you make a trail in the woods and you clear the path, but you never walk that way again, that road is never traveled again, it won't be long before you won't be able to distinguish the trail and the woods. But if you make the way of the path and you beat the path with your feet day after day and you keep the briars cleared and the branches trimmed, before long that path will be well seen. It will be well worn. It will begin to widen and it will be easy to find. See, but the road that leads to life, Jesus said, it's narrow. It's, it's hard to find. Why is it hard to find? Because so few people travel the road of a Christian. Seldom in the world today, we, see, everybody says they're a Christian. But the word Christian simply means Christ-like. You are like Christ. Just because you put on an NFL jersey doesn't make you an NFL player. Just because you wear a uniform doesn't make you a police officer or a military personnel. There's tests to pass. There's accomplishments. There's things that you must do. And Jesus said that you have to strive to enter by the narrow gate and few find it. But preacher, I'm a good person. I'm a good person, preacher. See, everybody thinks they're good. Everybody believes that what they think is right. I'm not an exemption. I, I just believe that what I think's right. I believe how I feel is right. So does everyone under the sound of my voice. How many divisions, arguments, divorces have come because two or more people thought they were right but the other person had a different idea of what was right. See, everybody's idea of good is different. I've seen churches bust up and split because two or three people said, oh, let's get blue carpet. Blue carpet's good. And then there'd be a handful of people that said, oh, we want to get green carpet. Green carpet's good. And then there might be one or two that says, oh, I like red. Well, let's get red. Who's right? Who's wrong? And they divide a church. Because everybody thinks that they're right in their own eyes. That's one of the reasons that Jesus left His Word. So we'd all be on the same page. That we'd have the same guideline, the same map to look at. It would be like going to a ball game. And you have referees. And every referee says, well, I'm just going to judge the call. I'm going to make the call. I'm going to blow the whistle. I'm going to watch the clock. I'm going to throw the flag according to what I think is right or good. See, they would be biased. They could have been paid off. They could be distracted. That's why in the NFL and in baseball and all the other sports, referees and umpires, they have a rule book. 
And it's that rule book that governs whether they make a decision or a call or not. And that's why God left us His Word. It's, it's the rule book so all would have the same opportunity to travel the same road and know what God requires. If being good would get you into heaven, then Jesus died in vain. See, the fact of the matter is we've all sinned. We've, we've all fell short. We've, we've all messed up. We've all told a lie sometime in our life. We've all stole something in our life. It could have been something physical. We could have stole time from the job. We, we've all took the Lord's name in vain somewhere in our life. We've all disrespected our parents. We've all broken the Ten Commandments. The Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. But thanks be to God, we won't be judged on our own goodness, but we'll be judged on the goodness of Jesus Christ. So if Christ is not living inside of you, then you'll be judged on your attempt to be good, and our attempts fail. Another sad truth from our text today is that many will be expecting to go to heaven they will live their life. They will sit in service after service. They will listen to song after song. And when they die, they will expect to enter heaven. We read the scripture in verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, there's only one that day in scripture, that day is the day of judgment. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, Master, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonders in your name? We went to church, Lord. Lord, we taught Sunday school. We helped in the home missions department. Lord, we sang in the choir. We, we sang a special. We, we fed the needy, Lord. We did all this stuff. Jesus is going to answer and say, I never knew you. I don't know you. Depart from me. See, we lose a little bit of the meaning of Scripture when we only look at it in the English language. Because in the Greek which the New Testament was written, the word new in Greek is the same word in English that we have for intimate, the union between a husband and a wife. And so God is saying, if you've not been intimate with me, if I don't know you in an intimate way, He'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. You can't be intimate with God and have sin in your life. You can't be intimate with God when you've cursed people out all week and you've been drinking and smoking and doing all these things. You can't be intimate with God. You first must ask God to forgive you. You must believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and then repent. Repent is not confession. Repent is turning from the sin. Well, let me break it down to you like this. If you're married today, you understand what I'm talking about. God designed marriage a union between one man and one woman. God said that He would bless that union. And part of that union is a sexual relationship. That's all. God only blesses that between one man and one woman in the bond of marriage. God blesses that so the man can meet the woman's need and the woman can meet the man's need inside the bounds of a marriage. But if you treat your wife bad and you're ugly to her and you disrespect her and you treat her like a slave, may I remind you that Eve was not taken from the heel of Adam, but Eve, when God put Adam in a deep sleep and said, I'm going to make you a help, Mate, He took Eve from the rib, the side, the equal. Husbands, when you're ugly to your wife and you mistreat her and you try to abuse her and you put her down, don't expect the bedroom to be intimate. You're not going to get your needs met. Well, the same goes for the woman. When a woman is not proud of her husband, that's, that's what a man wants. A man, a man just wants their wife to be proud of them. But when you always compare your husband to the guy that makes more money or has a better receipt or a better head of hair or drives a nicer car, and all you do is put your husband down and you don't tend to his, his needs as a wife, 
There's going to be problems with intimacy. And that's what the scripture is telling us today. If we're not intimate with the Lord, He'll say, I never knew you. The word intimate simply means our salvation. We've been saved. We've been redeemed. Our sins have been washed away. We are no longer the old man, but the new man has been birthed. Salvation is that moment in life that you can pinpoint and say, I was saved. I acknowledge by the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that I was a sinner. I was headed to hell. I needed help. And you surrendered your life to Jesus. So you confessed your sins. You asked God to come into your life. You told Him you couldn't make it without Him. You believed on Him. And now you're living for Him. If that took place in your life, then you've been born again. See, if you've truly been born again, see, being saved is more than a one-time prayer. Again, we have cheapened heaven and we've weakened hell. Too many preachers say, just raise your hand and repeat after me. That may be the beginning of your journey of salvation, but praying a prayer doesn't necessarily save you. Jesus said, those that do the will of my Father in heaven. What's God's will? That you live for Him. That you worship Him. And that you be faithful to Him until the end. He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. If you're truly saved today, and God is your heavenly Father, see, there's just something about genetics. There's just something about DNA. You may have never met your great-great-grandfather, but you do things like him. You may have never met your great-great-grandmother, but you have the same traits as she does. And if you've truly been born again, if you've knelt an altar and you surrendered your heart and you turned your life around and you repented and you said, I, I don't want to live that way no more, then you will have the personality of your Father in heaven. And the Father in heaven loves everybody. We have a problem in church today. We pick and choose who we love. And we all we pick out the sins. We take the top five and we say, we don't love them or the sin. We're not supposed to love the sin anyway. But what the church has done, we've hated the sinner along with the sin. We've chosen to only love people that like the same things we do, that dress like we do, that like the same style of music as we do. And the Father in heaven, His heart is broken. For He loves everybody. If you've been born again by the blood of Jesus and you're living for Him, then you will hate what God hates. God loves His church. The church is the body of Christ. And unless you're disabled or you don't have the ability to get out of the house, I just don't believe that you're going to make it to heaven having home church in front of the television. Because the church is the body of Christ. And if you've been born again, then you've been connected to the body. And if the body, if a member of the body is disconnected, if you cut your arm off, you've only got a few moments to reattach it or it will die. And if you disconnect yourself from the body, you'll die. But if you've been saved, if you've been born again, then you will desire to be connected to the body of Christ. You will desire to have fellowship with the other members of the body. If you've been born again, you will love the Word of God. You will love having a conversation with Him. You will love communing with the Father in Heaven. One of the greatest things on earth is when the family is in perfect harmony and everybody's getting along. Nobody's comparing and comparing this or bringing up this sin or saying I'm better than this or reminding of this fault. But when a family comes together, they can have a meal and they can laugh and rejoice then the Father in Heaven if you've been born again, He loves looking down and seeing His children get together, not just on Sunday or Sunday night or Wednesday, but He loves to see His children fellowship. If you've been born again, you won't want to miss church or church activities because you're part of the body of Christ. If you've been born again, you'll have to tell somebody about what Jesus has done for you. 
You don't have to preach to them. People are just looking. The world is searching. The world is seeking. They're hungry for help and hope. And all you need to do is tell them your story. Jesus goes on to say in these few verses that the difference between the lost and the saved is the fruit they bear. If you're here today, or you're listening by way of the internet, if you've been born again, you will bear good fruit. You'll love. You'll have compassion. You'll have mercy for people. You'll be forgiving. But Jesus said that you'll know a tree by the fruit it bears. Lost people bear rotten fruit. Sinners sin. The problem is we have too many pretenders. They pretend to be saved. So long in fact they convince themselves they're saved. But lost people bear rotten fruit. They, they're deceptive. They tell lies. They live on pride. They're unforgiving. They're always bringing up the past. Lost people are easily offended by everything. As Jesus is talking in our text that we read today, He's telling us that it is urgent for you and I to realize this could be our last opportunity to receive Him as Lord and Savior. Too many die. Throughout the history of the world, too many have died with good intentions. They died lost, putting off the Lord Jesus Christ. Too many today believe they have plenty of time. They put off. In fact, you're here today. I see conviction on your face. You can't wait to get out of here. And if you wouldn't be embarrassed, you would run out the door right now. What that is, that is the convicting power of the Holy Spirit because you know that you're lost today. But you keep saying, I'll put it off to another day. I'll put it off to another year. I'm going to go do this. I want to achieve this. i got this plan. But the fact of the matter is, life is but a vapor. It's here one second and gone the next. We are not promised tomorrow, preacher. You're trying to scare me. Yes, I am. If I thought scaring you would pull you to the altar, then I would do all I could to scare you because hell is real, but heaven is sweet, and you have a choice to make today. The tragedy of it all is you don't have to be lost. Hell was not created for you and I. Hell was created for Lucifer. God only created four archangels. And one of them allowed pride to get in his heart. And he fell from heaven. And since the fall from heaven, he's been tempting man. Because he is for eternal, eternally lost. And man, every day that man lives, the day is a gift. We have an opportunity to receive eternal life, to be with the Lord forever. And Satan hates that. Because where the saved are going, Satan left from. And the tragedy of it all is many, many will be lost. You don't have to be. And if you die and go to hell, you'll go to a place that wasn't made for you. You'll go there uninvited and you'll spend a life in torment. Luke 19.10 for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. 2 Corinthians 6.2 Behold now. Now, today is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Have you been born again? Does it mean that you're going to live a perfect life? No. I wish I could stand before you today and say, I've not messed up since January 1995 when I come to the realization that I couldn't fix myself, I couldn't stop sinning on my own, and I knew that one day I would die, and I knew where I was headed, and so I bowed my knee, and I cried out to God to save me, and He did. I wish I could tell you I've never failed, but I can't. But I can tell you this, God is faithful. 
God who is rich in mercy, who abundantly pardons. You've been born again today. If you met the Lord, are you ready to stand before Him and give an account for what you did with His Son? Let me tell you something. For those of us today that have a family, for fathers and mothers that have children, for grandparents that have grandchildren, nobody wants their child or spouse to be messed with. You mess with my family. Something bad's going to happen. And God is saying that I sent my only son to die. You abused him, you mocked him, you spit on him, you laughed. He was the sacrifice for your sins. He's the only means of salvation. And God is telling us that one day we're going to give an account. Have we rejected his son? Have we ignored his son? Or have we received him? Is something missing in your life today? If you try everything the world has to offer, it felt good for a little while. But then later it left you more broken. Are you looking for answers? Are you looking for hope? Are you looking for healing? Are you looking for love? Are you looking for a miracle today? Are you looking for joy and peace? Are, are you looking for something today that will change your life? Jesus is the answer. As we mentioned earlier, in this entitlement society, in this entitlement society that says we deserve everything everybody else has and, and we've let it come into the church and churches are preaching that everybody's going to heaven. And what's happened over time since the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago, we have weakened hell. We've, we've made hell out to be a place that's not going to be so bad. It's just going to be a good big party. You know, there's, there's not going to be so bad, but Hell is the most horrible place you could ever go. In hell you will have your senses. We know this by the story of the rich man in Lazarus. The rich man, the Bible says, who was in torments, lifted up his eyes. He had sight. He could hear. He had a speech. He had a body. He had flesh. And he was in torments. And he could not escape it. Day and night he was tormented. He was reminded of every moment he rejected the Savior. And we've weakened hell. We've made hell out to be a place that's just a party that, that maybe even after some amount of time that you just don't exist anymore. See, the fact of the matter is hell is a real place. And if you die without the Lord, if you reject Him, if you ignore Him, if you cast Him aside, then you will die without Him and be lost for eternity. Hell ought to scare us so bad. We've cheapened heaven. Heaven is the most glorious, wonderful place. In fact, I have not seen, ear has not heard. We can't even fathom, our mind can't even comprehend what heaven's going to be like. But when we read the scripture, we get a little taste of it. It's a place that there will be no tears, there will be no dying, there will be no crying, there will be no sweating, there will be no heartbreaks, there will be no divorce. There'll be no pain. There'll be no sorrow. It'll be a place of harmony, of perfect peace where we worship the Lord and we be at His will. We should make it a priority to get to heaven. The thought of everlasting hell. The other night I was sitting on the porch. My wife was gone. I was just sitting there alone. And I built a fire in the fire pit. And I sit there, as I often do, and drink a cup of coffee and just ponder about Sunday service. And do I have the right sermons and the right words to say? And I begin to watch the flames and feel the heat. And I said, Lord, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to that place, Lord. Lord, is there anything in my life? Lord, is there something that would separate me from you? If I fail, if I sin, if I rejected you, Lord, search me, try me, see if they be any iniquity in me. That's what God desires to do today. He's desiring for you to allow Him to turn on the spotlight and search your heart. Are you saved today? Have you been born again today? Have you been redeemed? 
know there's lost people here today. One of the greatest pictures of this is in Revelation 3.20. It's the last message to the seven churches. They were seven little churches. They were literal churches with literal pastors in Asia Minor, which is Turkey today. And John wrote to those churches physically, but those churches also represent church ages. Revelation 3.20, it's the last church age. And it's a picture that Jesus is, is on the outside. He's knocking on doors. Many of you have probably seen the portrait that was painted. and It's Jesus standing on the door of a stone house with a wooden door. There's no window and there's no doorknob, but there's a knock. That's what Jesus is doing this morning, right now. He's knocking on heart's door. The thing of, the, the thing of it is, he's a gentleman. He's only going to knock so long. He's not going to force him way in. He's not going to kick the door down. He's simply going to knock. But the longer you ignore the knock, the louder you turn up your life, the less you'll hear the knock. And one day the knock will grow faint and you will no longer hear it. But I know today that you feel the knock of the Holy Ghost on the door of your heart. God wants to save you. God wants to set you free. God wants to forgive you of your sin. You know the bottom line, the fact of the matter is what God wants is a family. Now God could have created a family. He could have forced them to do right. It would have been like robots. But God created man, put him in the Garden of Eden, knowing that they would fail. But he knew that out of the descendants of Adam, Adam and Eve, that they would be a remnant of people that would say, Lord, we want you to be our Father. We will, we will accept Jesus as our Savior and elder brother. God wants a family. I believe you want to be a part of that family today. It's an everlasting family. It's an eternal family. It's a family that will not be divided. It's a family that won't taste death. It's a family that won't suffer. We'll eat meals that are marvelous. We'll have a palace and mansion in heaven. But the only way to be a part of that family is to accept the sacrifice. Because sin has separated us from God. We can't earn salvation. We can't buy salvation. If we could live a million years, we couldn't earn it. If we had all the money in the world, we couldn't buy it. But Jesus said, I will give my life. I will pay the sin debt that you owe. All you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do the will of the Father. What's the will? It's found in the book. And endure to the end. The same shall be 